Hello, good evening, Kansas. This is Dr. Jay Steinmetz, and you are watching the Kansas Legislature, our Friday evening show where we talk about politics in Kansas with representatives from Topeka. And we have here three uh, uh, representatives with us, two uh, representatives from the House and one senator. And we're going to go around the table now and have them introduce themselves before we begin with questions. Uh, before we do our introductions, though, let me remind you, this is a call-in show. Uh, Kansas, anywhere in the state, can call in uh, and ask questions to their representatives directly, questions on anything that they find to be relevant. Uh, the number for uh, the call-in is 1-800-337-4788. That number is 1-800-337-4788, and we look forward to your calls. Now let's uh, meet the representatives here. We'll begin uh, with you, Ken. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Welcome to Kansas. Glad to, uh, glad to have you here, so looking forward to it tonight. I'm Ken Rogers from the 110th District. Uh, that is uh, rural Ellis County, uh, Rooks, Norton, Phillips, and uh, a small part of Graham County, including uh, the city of Hill City. Great. Welcome to the show, Ken. Thank you. John? I'm John Dahl. I'm State Senator from Garden City. My district is the 39th district that has uh, includes 10 counties. Uh, we butt up against Oklahoma, butt up against Colorado, you know, so I got all the southwest territory. I think about the size of Delaware is what I understand. <laughs> Great. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you. And Susan? Well, good evening and happy Valentine's Day. Um, I'm Susan Concannon. I represent uh, three and a half counties in north central Kansas. That includes Mitchell, Cloud, Ottawa, and half of Lincoln County. All right, wonderful. And so here we are with the Kansas Legislature. Again, my name is Dr. Jay Steinmetz. I'm an assistant professor in political science at Fort Hayes State University. Um, let's jump right into it again. Last week we started with Medicaid expansion. Let's start with Medicaid expansion again. It's an important issue. Um, polls show that most Kansans are supportive of Medicaid expansion. They want to know where we are in the process. Where are we in the process? From what we understand last week, things are a little bit stalled. Uh, there's maybe a bit of a relationship between Medicaid expansion and the failure to vote on the abortion amendment and bring that amendment to the voters of Kansas. Can you talk about where we're at right now? How do we move forward with it? And also kind of give your uh, uh, stance on the issue, whether or not you support Medicaid expansion. Let's start with you, Susan. Okay, great. Um, I have uh, supported Medicaid expansion for seven years, so I've worked on this for a long time. But last year, we passed a Medicaid expansion bill out of the House that um, it was over in the, uh, on the Senate side in the Health Committee. Uh, in the interim, uh, Senator Denning, uh, had, made, had a compromise then with the governor, a compromise bill that had, had some changes in it. It, uh, it had a work referral. Um, it, it has a path to pay for it with a surcharge on hospitals. Uh, and there's several other things. So that was, uh, that, that came to us this year um, uh, in, the, in the committee. They, the interim committee worked on it and uh, it, it, we thought it was going to come first thing, and then the constitutional amendment um, came along, and we started working on that. That had to go through first. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, the constitutional amendment vote failed uh, last week. We needed in the House, the Senate passed it, the House uh, needed 84 votes, and we just got 80, and so they, the, our leadership has said, we're not going to work on Medicaid expansion anymore until the constitutional amendment mm -hmm. passes. And this so we're was, stuck. Yeah, so we're stuck. And this was referred last week as, as a kind of political stuck. Um, does that make sense to you, John? What, what exactly does it mean for this to be stuck? And how are these two things tied together, if, if you can help uh, make sense of that for the average Kansas voter? Well, it's, uh, it's absolutely stuck. And to make sense, it's a political there, it's a political hot game is what it amounts to. To me, we're a pro-life state. That means from the womb to the tomb. I think that Medicaid expansion is as important to the pro-life movement as a, as a constitutional amendment. Jim Denning's plan is, I'm, I'm way behind. And not only as Susan discussed it, uh, the hospital has a surcharge, it's budget neutral. If the 
you know, what's going on at Washington. If it gets cut back, we have an opt out if it starts costing us more. So it will not increase pro uh, taxes. As a matter of fact, for I have 10 counties and nine of them are very rural and they all have all of them. We have 10 hospitals. Mm -hmm. I have a list of how many uh, males go just to the county hospitals themselves. Mm -hmm. I believe that Medicaid expansion could be a, a reduced property taxes a great deal. Plus, we'll get 130,000 people. Kansas is made up of small businesses. They cannot get health insurance. They cannot afford health insurance. This is a pathway. It only makes sense for us to pass Medicaid expansion. By being held up by the Constitutional Amendment is disingenuous to the citizens of Kansas. It's disingenuous to I, I, it, it, it bothers them to me that we cannot come to an agreement why this is being held hostage because we have people running for political office that want to hold it hostage because they think they can get the far right vote for the primary of, the, of certain races. Not uncommon for bills to be held hostage and to, and to get caught up in a political process, but I can see your frustration and Kansan voters, uh, especially those supportive of Medicaid expansion, um, frustrated as well. Um, what hope, what kind of, uh, where do we go from here? What do you think the plan is moving forward? We, if it comes to the Senate floor, the House has passed it twice mm -hmm. and we've held it hostage, which is very, if it came to the Senate floor, it would get, uh, well, I think we had 22 sponsors for the Denning bill, the Denning Kelly bill. If it came to the floor, we'd get 24, 25 votes. Mm -hmm. It's the Senate wants it. Uh, I think the, I think the people, as you indicated, the polls overly overwhelming, overwhelmingly want it. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, the process forward might be is 24, if we get 24 votes, we can pull it out of the committee and force it to come to the floor. It might come to that. But you know, I have a lot of admiration for our leadership. I really do. I don't agree with them on certain things. On this one, I don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. You don't want to, to, to bring the 24 because it just it's not a good look for anyone but you know if it comes at, that the bottom line is this bill for rural Kansas is as important as any bill I've been in in the eight years I've been in, in Topeka and then prior to that I was on you know I've been in politics now for 14 years this might be the most critical bill other than the brownback tax experiment that we've dealt with mm. uh, it seemed like last year if, correct me if I'm wrong if I remember they needed 24 to get it out of committee last right. year and it failed what can you speak a little bit as to as to why you're worried about that? What what the consequences are, and and what might be different this year as opposed to last year? Because they hold chairmanships over your head, mm -hmm. uh, as as Ken and I were talking earlier, vice chairmans over your, people want that vice chairmanships are, are cool to have on your resume. I guess they don't really have any power, but it's uh, it's a cool thing to say, I guess. But <laughs> so they they will threaten them with taking away their chairmanships. They'll take away their committees. You know, I, I, a couple of my colleagues was saying, man, you're on this particular committee, Ways and Means Committee. That's, that's a good committee for you. How, how much longer do you want to be on that? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they play those kind of games with you mm -hmm. in order to, you know, buckle. Mm -hmm. You know, my, uh, I've been known I don't buckle. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can speak my mind because the worst that happened to me is I can get beat in the next election and I get to go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, can we maybe just uh, pause for a second, John, and talk about hospitals directly, hospitals in rural Kansas. Mm -hmm. There was a political article published in 2017, I don't know if you're familiar with it, about a hospital in Lakin, so your district and your yeah. area, that's actually a success story. Very can basic. you talk about what makes that a success story and how we can bring that to other rural hospitals in Kansas? They have a, a very dynamic program that they did they they uh, they go get doctors that are that are mission orientated and they allow them to come and work for two years go work their mission and then they come back and they can work you know they'll they'll have their job back yeah. he, he he he's very innovative he just recently left Benjamin Anderson and went to to Denver but he was very innovative in creating getting providers there mm -hmm. and such mm -hmm. but He's another one. He'll tell you how important Medicaid expansion is mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Another thing with rural hospitals, I, you know, there's a postcard. We've been talking about getting postcarded. 
there was, I got a robo call and they said 7.7% .7 of the money will only go to rural hospitals. And that could be true, but right now we've walked away from $4.4 .4 billion. If you can imagine 7.4% of $4.4 .4 billion going to rural hospitals, that then they can get doctors, then they can lower their property tax. It's, it's, to me, it is an absolute no-brainer for rural Kansas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me remind the viewers as well, this is a call-in show. We appreciate your calls. The number to call is 1-800-337-4788. That phone number is 1-800-337-4788. And now let's go to Ken. Same question about Medicaid expansion. Anything, anything you want to add there? Um, how supportive are, are you supportive of Medicaid expansion? What hope is there of pushing this through in the future? Where, where do we go from here? Susan Kincan, Representative Kincan, and I agree on about 99 out of 100 issues. This is one that I am one of a few in western Kansas that represents a portion of western Kansas that has never been supportive of it. Doesn't mean I'm not supportive of health care. I think so much of the time we hear so much rhetoric. We hear so many numbers being thrown out. I'm not necessarily opposed to it completely, and you know, if you want to make a sound bite of that, you can. Senator Roberts, on the federal level, is working on changing reimbursement rates. That's something important. Critical access hospitals are different than those, you know, that have closed in Kansas. Those haven't been critical access county operated hospitals. So, you know, we can have this discussion, you know, what's, but there is no plan B either. What happens if, again, it gets held up for whatever reason? Mm -hmm. um, elections have consequences. People elect either every two or four years, and every two and four years, the House and Senate decide amongst are as a group who's going to be the leaders mm -hmm. and leaders decide and you know and if, if others want to move on and try to use, it, it's unfortunate regardless of what the issue is you know I was talking to constituents on the way out here tonight of my frustration we have finished five weeks we have one bill done in the house mm -hmm. I don't mean to avoid the question but where do we go from here mm -hmm. I think leadership wants in the house and senate wants us to take another crack at the value of them both amendment. Pick up four votes, be it Republicans or Democrats, and I think once that's done, then it goes to the people, the governor can't veto it, goes to the people, then I think we get this train back on the tracks. I would hope, you know, I talked to the governor the night of the state of the state, and I said, Governor, I'm looking forward to finding out what's in the budget, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm not with you on Medicaid expansion, but I'm not going to fight you on it. I understand, you know, the numbers are there. And so, you know, that, that's where we're going to go. But again, I, I've always asked, you know, we throw numbers out, but do we truly have a good idea of how much is, is coming to our hospitals, how long it's going to be, and how much the total cost is going to be? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and as long as people are willing to have that discussion, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens because there's a number of issues that we have to deal with. And all of a sudden, you know, we're two weeks away from, a turnaround, which is the halfway point of the session, so we've, you know, there's there's a lot of things we'd like to like to uh, to get done. So, so just to be clear and, and and very quickly, you're supportive of the coupling of these two issues of if Medicaid expansion is going to happen at all, even though you're not supportive of it, if it's going to happen at all, uh, this abortion amendment process has to be dealt with first. What I am saying is, leadership wants this amendment to pass. President Wagle, Senator President Wagle said she wants it to pass, go on to the voters, and then things will move on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, again, we, I, th I hope we have learned our lesson that the House members can't tell the Senate what to do and vice versa. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the situation that I'm a little concerned about is, you know, somebody wagging their finger and saying, you know, the other side, well, you have to do this, you have to do that, or the governor, instead of talking to us as members, goes, and held a press conference instead of saying, you know, let's what what can we agree with rather than trying to fight our, our battles through letters, emails, and the media. Thank you for the response. Um, uh, we have a caller here. This is Ann from Russell. Good evening, Ann. What is your question? Thank you. When the federal government offered Medicare expansion to the states, it was 90% funded by the government by the federal government for one year. Then it fell to the states to fund after that. Is that still the way this works? And if so, can we Kansans afford that? 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go with Susan for that question. Thank you, Ann. Well, thank you for the question, Ann. Um, the uh, federal government, when, when Medicaid expansion was first offered to the state, it was offered 100%. 100% uh, paid by the federal government for three years, and then has ratcheted down to not, where it's at 90% now. We are, we will, the federal government has said that they will not fall b below 90%. They've had votes to that effect. And um, so the Congress has supported that we are at 90% and staying there. So the bill that we um, have now that we're looking at has what we call a poison pill in it that would say if it ever would fall below 90%, we would actually discontinue with Medicaid expansion in Kansas. Okay, great. That sounds pretty clear. Anyone want to add anything else to that? or That's what we were talking about on the opt-out. Mm -hmm. if, if it goes below that, with Denning and Kelly's bill, we can opt out any time it became more than if, if it got below 90% from federal funding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sound good. Um, we have another caller here, Randy from Great Bend. Good evening, Randy. What is your question? Good evening. Thank you. Mine concerns the constitutional amendment. My representative voted for it, but what can we as constituents out here do to help get that pushed through? From what I understand, Randy, you're asking, what can the constituents do? What can the Kansans do to help push this issue through? Let's go with Ken on that one. Well, I think if you, you, know, if you know who voted against it, uh, uh, and, and if they know somebody that is it, that's in that district, uh, call them. Have a conversation and, and figure out uh, why. I mean, again, it's, it's, that's the ugly side of politics. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, if this was all fun and games, you, you'd have everybody wants to do it. Mm -hmm. And so th these are some of the kind of the, the brass knuckles things that happens. And so um, four votes short, and you can't say, well, yeah, there's four Republicans, but there was a bunch of Democrats that we believe that are pro-life. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that'll be the case. It's, it's, it's a lot. You can put whatever issue you want to. I think it's the same way with, with Medicaid expansion. It's, that's bipartisan, absolutely. And so, and I think this issue should be too. And, uh, and that's where I think, you know, we talk about coming together and compromise. And, and honestly, right now, I don't believe the governor's doing that at all. Mm -hmm. she, she's, she's putting a lot of pressure on, on her party and her, the members of her party. Um, let me press you a little bit on the, the issue of the lack of the four votes for the ab abortion amendment. Is this, <clears throat> the lack of a four votes, is this a sign that the Republican majority in the House can't get the things done that they want to do? Can't? put the check marks on, on their priorities. Uh, what kind of political fallout is there from a failure to get these four votes on the abortion amendment? Well, I think, again, having two thirds, it's always hard, regardless of the issue, to get 84. Mm -hmm. 63 is, is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, but 84, really on any issue, is, is tough. And so is there political fallout? I, who knows? I, I don't know. You know, the leadership is kind of keeping it close to the vest on if there's going to be anything. But again, at this point, some sort of retribution, retaliation, what would that do? Because there's still other issues the leadership wants to get past. So, you know, I, I, I you know, I, and I think idle threats don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, I want to make something perfectly clear. The constitutional amendment would pass in the House and pass in the Senate if it was ran in November. It, by putting it in August, it does two things. Number one, historically, you being a political science guy, you would understand this too. There's about a 50% less turnout in a primary than there is in a general. Mm -hmm. Secondly, for there's over 30% of Kansans are independent or libertarians. Those counties themselves would be responsible to print those ballots, which would cost Finney County $4,000. We got them on a property tax lead. We at, at the legislature are so concerned that on property tax, that's, that's the Lucifer of taxes. If we ran this thing in November instead of August, it would clear the House overwhelmingly and in the Senate. As a matter of fact, in the Senate, I offered that amendment. It passed the Senate. My amendment failed to move that election to November. There again, we're being disingenuous with the population of Kansas. By moving it to August, they're afraid that Planned Parenthood would, this is what's told me, would outspend the KFL 
four to one. They are afraid it would fail in, in November. But the bill that passed says August primary. It didn't pass. Well, the sit here, well, it came to us that way. Here's the deal. If, uh, you should, I would hope the people vote in the primary. There's going to be primaries in the first district for both for, for Congress and both the Republicans and Democrats. Um, you know, hey, I guess I participate. Uh, I, I understand the situation, but let's, you know, that, that's, that's, again, this is a, a part of the political process. Um, you know, and I don't know if we may get to the point, if it's that important to pass, if it comes back and in November, then um, let the chips fall where they may. It pass overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. We'll move on. Susan, you want to add anything there? I, <laughs> this well, has been great. I'm just following <laughs> it. <laughs> Enjoying the fireworks? Uh, we have another caller here, Jen from McPherson. Good evening, Jen. What is your question? Good evening. Uh, I'm just sitting listening to the conversation, and I'm really, I'm really enthralled of it because my whole family's lost the hospitals. They're going to everywhere around there, three or four hospitals, a heart attack. They're looking for an ambulance. And I know that not all the money will be coming there, but what little bit's going to come in there is going to be a benefit to the people. And one other thing I want to ask you about is that there are two wonderful gentlemen that are service-minded, but they're sitting there. If I don't vote a certain way, I may not get a vice chairmanship, or I may not get a chairmanship. Or as Susan says, if I can't have it my way, I'm taking my marbles and going home. Please, work for all of us. Please, represent us, please. Thank you for the comments, Jen. I appreciate it. Any response there for, for Jen's comment? I agree with her entirely. It, yeah. it's, uh, that's, we're supposed to be there working for the people. Mm -hmm. And the people want Medicaid expansion. That Every poll that you see is that. And we're holding it hostage over political games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I just want to back up to the comment about losing chairmanship. Uh, Senator Dahl would, would never... <laughs> would never uh, forego a, a, a vote over a, a, over a chairmanship. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that was your comment, right? That yeah, was the reason I, why I, you mentioned I, it. If people know me well enough, I, I, I kind of speak my mind and, and let the chips fall where they go. And uh, People try to hold me hostage. I seem probably to fight back a little bit more than I should. I'm mm -hmm. a little bit competitive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have another caller here. Uh, this is Maria from Ellis. Good evening, Maria. What is your question? Yes. Uh, I would like to know what the status is on the House Bill 2484. And could you give us a little bit of detail what that House Bill is, Maria? Increase on good time credits for inmates. For inmates. For the, we had a question on this last week. Uh, anyone want to take that question on? I don't, I don't think any of us sit on the, um, the Corrections Committee, and um, I, I have seen it that it's on the um, calendar, but I, I'm, it hasn't gotten far enough along in the process to know exactly you know, what's going on with it. I, I talked with Chairman Jennings yesterday, and, and there's a number of all these issues coming together, and it just happens to be, again, with what we've spent the first ha half of the show talking about, because of that, and once these things kind of break free, because I think there's a number of reforms that they're wanting to move forward, and so that's, I mean, I, I wish we had a bigger update, but there's really not much, honestly, there wasn't a whole lot done this last week, mm -hmm. you know. So. A lot of committee work. Yeah. <clears throat> but and, and that seems to be the bigger problem that is encompassing all these different issues that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Legislature's moving really slow. Only one bill. Um, <clears throat> is it about the, the individual issues themselves? Or is it something else? Or is it something that representatives should be mobilized to uh, perhaps not couple these things together? And oh. No, I, 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 it's the process. I mean, it's, it's a typical process. And uh, uh, one of the things also keep in mind, this is uh, with Governor Kelly, we've gone to uh, not, not biannual budgets. So we want annual budgets. And so that, that is one of the situations we're dealing with. And, and there's just a, a myriad of issues. And so, um, you know, a lot of times the first couple of weeks, there's, there's, there's not a ton that goes on. And, and it's, it's slowly getting done. And every year, uh, you know, we, we, we start with the best of intentions to get things fired out right off the gate. And uh, we end up the last few days just doing 
40, 50 pills possibly, you know, to get them all through. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about uh, revenue. Uh, Tax-only revenues um, were 723 million in January. That's an 8.76 percent uh, increase above estimates. 12 um, uh, and a half percent above last January. Um, this is good news. Revenue is coming in. Is it good news? Where should we go with, from here? Does this create a political environment in which we should be looking at um, tax cuts or you know returning? Uh, taxpayer dollars back to back to the taxpayer. What do you think, John? Well, first of all, if, if you if you take it out more years, I think in 2023, I believe we're back into the red, even with this going on. This is a great news, though. I introduced a bill called the Abilorum that well, it was it's always been there. 2020, uh, 2002, they took the money away. What it did would take 54 million dollars sends it back to the counties and they can only use it for property tax relief. Uh, we're going to get a hearing on that bill, but if I had my rathers, you know, tax cuts, we need to tax cuts, but we need to do them in property tax. Income tax, you know, that, that, that's all well and good, but what's hurting the people, especially in my district, in rural Kansas and as a whole, are property taxes. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm hoping we can look at something like the ad valorem, take away that, maybe cut food sales tax, things that are, that would, help the people that in, in rural Kansas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Susan, any thoughts about that? Uh, revenue, create an environment in which um, tax cuts or some kind of savings for the taxpayer is, well, is feasible? Yeah, we'd like to get to that place that, that um, John was talking about, but you know, we're still, we're still trying to recover from um, all of the cuts we went, to, went, went through a few years ago. You know, we've got a state mental hospital that's struggling. We've got roads and bridges, and we need to catch up on CAPERS payments. We, you know, th there's a lot of things that, that are our, our responsibility mm -hmm. that we need to um, make sure that are paid for before we start thinking about cutting taxes. Mm -hmm. so, I'm, so I'm hearing, uh, be cautious with revenue. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, going back to that, to you were you were talking about before property taxes. That's a big concern for you, John. That's um, yeah. That's as big concern as I have as far as taxes. And, and um, you know, the the sticky situation with property taxes is is always that they're 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 bound to you know uh, paying for public education. Do, broadly, what's your position on that? Is that it, that's an inevitable relationship, right? Uh, that would take a lot of political energy to change. Um, but what's your what's your uh, thoughts on that? The relationship between property taxes, public education, the need to, of course, uh, uh, you know, spend the money on public education, a quality public education in Kansas. I'm a former school teacher, <laughs> uh, you know, so public education is extremely important to me. But you know, when I got into politics and what I try to, what I want to be known for, when when my time is done as a politician, I want to be known as a localist. And so I think that each district should be able to do with what their property tax, what they want. I think the t state themselves need to state, you know, we need to help all we can, the funding that we can with property tax and that with property taxes more for the capital outlay, you know, where the state comes in for the, for the equity and all that. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, the, the tax uh, ad valorem thing I think would be good, but what bothers me about state government, just like federal government, we keep throwing unfunded mandates down on local government, and it increases just like the $4,000 for the ballots when if it was in November, we wouldn't be paying that $4,000. That's just, that's a drop in the bucket, but that's just a perfect example. You know, public education is uh, dear to me, but the property tax aspect just takes care of capital outlay for the mm -hmm. most part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ken, thoughts about the revenue? Um, uh, sign of caution, we should be cautious, or is this, or is this a kind of environment that we should be looking at? Um, Senator you can, I should sit on the House Tax Committee, so we've dealt with, with these issues now for several years. Uh, you know, uh, yes, I mean, I, I, mean, I think you, you look at it, you look at revenues are up. Uh, now let's, let's, let's be honest why revenues are up with the federal tax situation, uh, things that the state did not do. And that's, you know, you, you, you can go into the two hours tonight and have a, we can have a debate like we did the first part of the show. And some say, well, the money's here now, let's do it to make the investments. And then we get really hotly political. And then, 
you know, and then we go to our corners, and then we cool off and come back. Um, one of the things we're going to, we'll try again, is to do that decoupling from the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, will it succeed? I don't know. I mean, it may get out of committee, but then where will it be on the floor? Um, you know, I know Senator Dahl has, has, a, has a, a plan. I you know, hope we get a chance to vote on it. I, I agree. I would love, let's, let's go back to 1992. I was on the school board then. And, and before this, the whole funding mechanism of how we fund schools. If, if that's what we want to do, I think that's, that's, that's sure worth an experiment. Uh, I hate to use that word, but, you know, that's something to look at. But, um, you know, I think, I think there's some opportunity. Uh, I would love to do a, a, a true reduction of sales tax on food, but it has to be the right way. We can't do it, you know, in a political, it's, it's very difficult to do it in a, in, a, in a political or a campaign year because then are you just doing it for, for rhetoric rather than truly uh, doing things. You know, in the House we passed uh, bills now uh, on, uh, on deductions, uh, standard deduction or itemized deduction, and th those are also big big dollars, but uh, like, uh, like my friend Senator Dahl, uh, looking at the numbers, I'm very concerned. I was concerned before we started the session. Mm -hmm. Even though it looks like we have all this money, it's really a, a pile of IOUs. That money's really already been spent if we continue to make, because one thing we haven't talked about yet is the increased money, well, the two things. One, <laughs> the increased money that needs to go to K-12, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I voted for it. I think as we build that budget, it needs to be. But the one thing we haven't talked about, and I brought it, you know, in the last governor's campaign it was not talked about, is our, is our debt, is our bond indebtedness. I mean, that, that is something that, that, you know, when we have the opportunity to have these dollars, you know, make the capers payment and, uh, and, and, and pay our debt. I mean, that's, those are things that, they're not, they're not pretty, they're not fun, they're not, they doesn't, there aren't good headlines, you know, but, but that's, being, that's being a good uh, steward of, of the people's money. Can you talk about a little bit more about that bonded debt? Where does it come from? To, to the average Kansan and the voter? Well, I mean, who, it, it, it comes from a number of different things. One, uh, it, it, higher education is part of it, but, but those through funding and other, you know, through fees, that's kind of taken care of. But uh, money that's been, I bet every year at the end when we do our big spending bill, we need to authorize some for transportation issues mm -hmm. because as, as the Bank of KDOT or whatever has gone to other things, We've still had things we've had to do. There are other situations like this. If, if, if the funds don't balance, well, kind of at the end of the year, it's kind of, well, if we need it, we grant bonding authority. And so slowly over time, it's built back up. And it's a, it, to me, it's, it's a, you know, and I, and I mentioned to, to some, is, that, is it, are we sustainable? But the amount of every Kansan, man, woman, child, that carries is well over $1,000. Our neighbor to the north of Nebraska is 23. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's something that, that we need to address. Uh, Susan? You know, another thing I would <clears throat> add, uh, you, what the time that we're in tax committee now is spent on going through all these different pieces of, of a tax plan. And then at the, towards the end of session, they'll put a package together and that's what we'll vote on. And that there becomes the problem is that things will pass out of committee a, a single item a single bill but once they put it together in a plan it's it, it looks very different and it's very difficult to pass um, let me remind uh, the viewers at home that this is a call-in show and you can ask any question you like the phone number here is 1-800-337-4788 this is a call-in show um, we'll take any question that you have the number again is 1-800-337-4788 <clears throat> Let's talk about, um, from my understanding, now I could be wrong here, but the tax committee uh, approved both the decoupling bill and the bill sponsored by Representative Jim Gardner to increase the standard deduction. Single filers, the standard deduction goes from 3000 to 4000 um, Joint filers from 7500 to 8000 uh, and uh, I can't remember. It's the single ha or household head of household single filers from up to six thousand or something like that. Uh, both of these passed the tax committee, right? They're out of the tax committee. Um, can you give us an idea of where they're going to go and what you think the prospects are for for both of those? Well, it's just like like I was just saying. It, you know, when, once it passes out of tax committee, then th they hold those below the line, so we don't really don't usually debate them on the floor, and then they go to conference with the Senate. And um, 
uh, that's when they put together, they choose what they, uh, is most, what's most important and put together a package. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, besides the fact that we are in a, a stalemate and nothing is going through, you know, that even if it was, we, we would not be seeing a tax bill on, tax bills on the floor this early. Okay. Um, uh, what, can I get uh, um, some idea of which one you support, each of you, uh, of these bills? So the uh, increasing of the standard deduction projected to cost about $50 million a year, deliver some tax relief, tax reductions to around 1.2 million Kansans. Um, the uh, uh, decoupling of the income tax itemization uh, is going to deliver about $61 million in less taxes to around 85,000, generally a lot more well-off Kansans, right? So 85,000 um, more w wealthier Kansans as opposed to 1.2 million Kansans for the increase in standard deduction. Um, which what do you support both of these, one or the other? And why? That's job. The, well, the decoupling aspect, I oppose it because of exactly what you said. I called revenue last year and got statistics. As far as tax exemption with the decoupling, the 400, it was 450 million last year. Six percent of, there's, before the Trump tax, you know, he's, he brought that up, which was great for Kansas. And we had 15 percent that took a standard deduction. Because he raised that so high, only 8% d does it now. So we have about 6%, 6 or 7% of the people who benefit from this that would get this $450 million. Most of them are out of state. Those are your major corporations. Those that have businesses, like in my district, like a Tyson or a Boeing, their headquarters are not in Kansas. So most of that $450 million leaves Kansas. So I very much support the other one because I want the money to stay in Kansas and so it recirculates in Kansas instead of going to Arkansas or Colorado or, or somewhere else. And I think what was mentioned last week is that the standard deduction for single filers hasn't been increased since the early 1990s or so. Uh, I'm, I just, I'm, the decoupling, I'm talking more, I'm, this year because I'm not on a tax committee, mm -hmm. I was talking about the last year because Susan Wagle sure. uh, yeah. and I <laughs> she, she really wanted this real bad, and, and so I got called to the office, the principal's office, a number uh -huh. of times because she was looking for votes. Uh -huh. And so I called Revenue and was get, got these statistics. And actually, the Kansas taxpayers who live in Kansas, 6% would benefit from the decoupling. Yeah. Well, so, but so I, not I, supporting yeah. decoupling, but it does do support I support increases anything, standard But deduction. my biggest deal is anything we can do to reduce property taxes. I would wish we'd put more in ad valorem to reduce property taxes because that's the burden. Mm -hmm. Ken. Well, you know, Spirit Airlines is not in my district. Or it's not Spirit Airlines, but Spirit in Wichita. It's the largest employer in the state. They're now paying sales tax on their sales. They're back up, you know, they're, they're off, they're going to ramp back up again. I don't want Spirit to go to Oklahoma City. And people might be rolling their eyes. How many aviation jobs have we lost to Oklahoma? I, I don't have that number, but I know we have. And so those and other businesses that have not paid taxes before on their sales out of the state, out of state are now paying them. I understand, I understand, and you know, it would be great if we could give, you know, everybody, hey, I'm paying higher taxes in Kansas, but it, you know that's but that's that's part of it because of what we do you know what we've done uh, I don't know where we're gonna end up if, if you want a bold prediction I don't I would guess we don't get anywhere I would like to I with would, either of them decoupling I, or increasing. I the doubt it production. I mean I, I just think we're gonna run out of time do, I, so you support decoupling it sounds like I, absolutely I, do do. I have since yes do you support the increase in standard deduction it, uh, if, if the possibility to do it, I voted for it in committee. Okay. okay. Um, uh, before we uh, get to Susan on that one, let's take a caller here. We have Rhonda in Wichita. Rhonda, good evening. What is your question? Um, gentlemen, madam, you all should know, first of all, that I am a certified public accountant. But isn't the real issue the fact that there is so much revenue that is never taxed? How do you mean that? You mean the sales tax exemptions? Well, all around, people working under the table, 
perky people working under false identification, um, people working for barter, nonprofits. There's so much that's simply never taxed. Okay, so we have a CPA in Wichita saying, you know, there's a lot of revenue in this state. Maybe that's one of the things that the legislature should look at, uh, going out and making sure that uh, the tax code covers, uh, you know, the money that's being made in the state. We give out way too many exemptions, I agree. Yeah. But once you go, want, let's say you want to go take away exemptions from Girl Scout cookies, and you're going to have about 80,000 brownies in the capital. So <laughs> throughout the years, well, it's, it's easy to give exemptions, but to get them back mm -hmm. off, mm -hmm. so I agree with her. We, we, I would love that if we would just take all exemptions off and start over with it and be a lot more thoughtful on the exemptions that we give. Now, Rhonda was talking about fraud, such like that, you know, yeah. but uh, there, that's nothing we can do about it. People are, there are people are gonna be people, it's like Houston Astros, you know, people are gonna cheat, you know, so it's, uh, you know, if they're, if they're, I hope they get busted if, they, if, they're, if it's fraud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Golden well, rule in politics is that it's very hard to take away specific benefits from specific people uh, what are your thoughts? Susan? Yeah, well, we've we've tried for years to <laughs> to clean up the uh, the number of sales tax exemptions. I, I I agree with John that it would be nice to just start all over and and ha have them come prove their their um, their reason for having one, but also then at a sunset so that five ten years out they have they need to come back to us and explain to us again why they need. But it it's a it's extremely unfair the way that we're doing it, that some rotaries get it, uh, some don't, um, some hospices get it, get a sales tax exemption, some don't. So it, it's very um, piecemeal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> let's stick with you, Susan, about the decoupling and the increasing the standard. You won't let that exemption. go away. <laughs> I, I want to get you on the record. <laughs> You know, I, what, which one do you, do you support, one over the other, or, or where do you stand? I voted yes on both of them. Uh, on both of them, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Um, anything that need, more needs to be said about that? Um, want to add anything else in there? You know, it, it, mm -hmm. sometimes we just want uh, things to move forward. Mm -hmm. Let's move it forward in the process. Mm -hmm. so. Get it on the floor and let voters vote. Mm -hmm. Get it out of committee, get it on the floor. Mm -hmm. Medicaid expansion, all of it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah. Well, and, and but let's if you want to bring that up again, the House passed it. Yep. And so I guess that's where I don't know why the House needs to be another vote again. The House has their position, and and so it's it's to me it's in the Senate's court. I couldn't agree more. And and you know so instead of you know having to make the other vote, with this, that's what happens when what each side has a position. You don't need to keep bringing it up. You know so but. Uh, this whole situation, we, last year we started another, or maybe two years ago, we started a bipartisan group looking at tax exemptions. Uh, manufacturing and agriculture, uh, those are well over $2 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, you start with one, you do the other, okay, now you have brownies, well then you'll have farmers. Yeah. Then you'll have every manufacturer come in to see you. And so that's, it is, it's very difficult. I think if you had a group of legislators that it was their last term, those would be the ones that would tackle it. I, 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 I mean, just laying it out there and being honest, I think those that, that uh, uh, you know, right now because of some of the situations, the uh, group came to me this year and, and wanted to know if they could, because some, some do and some don't. So I went to the tax chairman, uh, Stephen Johnson, and said, what's our thought? And well, probably not this year. Because again, wanting to look at, but where do you start? Yeah, and somebody brought one up a couple of days ago in committee, uh, a bill for a, a new sales tax exemption, and they said, okay, are we going to go there? Are we opening that can of worms right. this year? Um, we have another caller here. This is Shirley from Bird City. Good evening, Shirley. What is your question? Yes, uh, I feel like that if they would cut a lot of this foster parent stuff and... Uh, start putting the children back in the home with the parents and help the parents instead of uh, putting all the money into taking them away and putting them in foster homes. I feel like that would be a great big help in our community. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, comments? So yeah, I'll start with that one. Um, I chair a committee called Children and Seniors on the House side, and uh, we deal a lot with the foster care issues. Um, we, we um, last year were working with a, um, the, the um, report, final report of a, a uh, child welfare tax, or uh, tax, you got me on tax, <laughs> child welfare um, uh, task force. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they recommended was this uh, Families First uh, bill that we passed last year that does get us um, some federal funding then to be able to address some of the needs for families on the front end mm -hmm. so that they so that children aren't taken from the family if there's if there's substance abuse problems um, you know what whatever the myriad of problems might be that a child would be in need in need of care to be removed um, if that's identified then there are we have funding now and we we do have contracts out there in the state that they can go into the homes and help in, in the beginning mm -hmm. as as her mm -hmm. comment mm -hmm. stated mm -hmm. comments uh, for, from the caller as a pro-life Christian <clears throat> our foster care system is embarrassing it's it's uh, it needs to get better it mm -hmm. uh, it should be a priority for us, and I, you know, with Susan's work, she, her and I came in at the same time in '12, and this has been, this has been her issue from the very beginning. She's done tremendous work on it, but we still have foster kids sleeping in offices. We have foster kids that, that should be a big priority for our state government is mm -hmm. taking care of people who can't take care of themselves, and foster kids fall into that category. Families first, I'm, we're all in, but there's sometimes it's not beneficial to the kid to be in that, you know, in that, in that home, and we have to have the, the intestinal fortitude to see that and get, get those kids adopted. They can't be sleeping in offices. We go, they go into our foster system, and, and as, as homeless kids, they come out as criminals, some of them. And, and it's got to change, and it's got to be an emphasis for Kansas because that's who we are, and we have to get better at it. Can you articulate some of the solutions? You know, that's Susan's job. I'm just, <laughs> I can just be a cheerleader, and I'll, I'll cheer for Susan all the way on that. She's an expert on it. What well, are some concrete uh, solutions that we can do to tackle this serious problem? Uh, well, we have over 7,000 children in Kansas in foster care, mm -hmm. and um, that's that's higher per capita than any other state in our area in our region. Um, we're trying to just pick pick things that concrete things that we can start addressing. The possibility would be uh, the office of a child advocate, and then and have an advocate for that child that will follow uh, follow them all through the system. Um, and um, we, you know we have we have CASA, we have caseworkers, and and still we're failing. We need to have um, we need to have some liaisons with our agency and with that are in the facilities not I'm not talking about uh, foster homes or adoptive homes I'm talking about in the facility to make sure that they are run and appropriately and children aren't we, we had a, re a child in front of us just last week said that they were um, in in a home in Kansas City not a home a, a care center where they were getting beat up and that nobody was paying attention to them and those are things that just that break your heart and, and so I, I actually went and had a meeting with the speaker t this morning and talked to him about um, trying to put together a, a, a um, foster care summit you know some something to just bring people together to find out what other states are doing to be successful because we, we need ideas, we need to change. Mm -hmm. But we do have a, a secretary that has a lot of, a new secretary now that has a lot of experience with foster care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> we're uh, running out of time, but we're gonna do uh, uh, one segment here. I'm starting a new segment on the Kansas Legislature TV show, Nation in the World Through the Kansas Lens, where we discuss national global issues a little bit, get your input and thoughts and insights on things that 
are going on in the nation and going on in the world from a Kansas perspective. And uh, <clears throat> I think the best place to start off is the U.S.-China trade negotiations. Um, from your perspective, it seems like we're at the end of the line, hopefully, with these negotiations. Uh, do you think the U.S. overall uh, has and will benefit from the trade dispute <clears throat> negotiation and what the plan is right now? Let's start with John. I always like to tell when people want to talk about federal issues, not my circus, not my clowns. we got a big <laughs> enough circus in Kansas with plenty of clowns. You know, the trade embargo, that's going to take time to, to come. Our farmers took a beating. Mm -hmm. and, and not only our farmers took a beating, but the manufacturers that made farm equipment took a beating. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a t long time for that to recover. That, the trade agreement with China, the Mexico-Canada trade agreement mm -hmm. is a good thing. It's a step forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just, it, once you lose a trade partner as, as much as we lost with China, and I'm not arguing the politics of it. Uh, you know, I'm, that's, there again, that's not my area. I just know what it did to my people. Mm -hmm. uh, might have been something we had to do because the trade imbalance was crazy bad. But we're, it's a step forward. Is it going to be enough? Time tell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ken, thoughts? Well, phase one is done. Uh, part of the situation is kind of twofold. One is a word we're learning now called seasonality. Typically, this time of the year, China doesn't buy much from the U.S. anyway. So before we all got excited, that was going to happen. The second thing is now coronavirus that has uh, de just devastated that uh, the, the country of China. Uh, the premier has said we will get this taken care of. It's a wait and see. I mean, obviously, you know, we still have a lot of grain around, but uh, mm -hmm. it's a situation that uh, I believe uh, uh, it will work. It's just going to take some time. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, Susan? Yeah. We're moving forward. I yeah. can't any, add anything to that. No more circus mm -hmm. or clowns or anything? Oh, yeah. I like that one. I'm going to use that one. <laughs> you mentioned the coronavirus outbreak. That's the uh, second question here. Any thoughts on steps Kansas should take regarding the coronavirus outbreak? Should Kansans be worried and to what degree? We hear that uh, you know the 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 annual flu maybe have to be just as devastating here. I mean, I'm, a, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know. I would say do what you know. What I do, I hydrate and I eat those little cuties. I try to get my vitamin C and uh, you know just try to you know get as much rest as, as you can and and uh, you know it's up to you to get you know it's probably too late for a flu shot this year if you want one. But but uh, you know I. As Kansans, I mean, I, you know, just uh, be cautious. What you know, use that stuff. You know, wash your hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love my state. You know, we're pretty much landlocked. <laughs> you know, China can deal with their deals, and you know, they come to the coasts and things like that. You know, I don't. I, I'm not worried about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually chair a national committee that's on um, preparedness, capacity, resilience, the, and. Um, so I actually have, have discussed some of the other talk, topics that are similar, not specifically to coronavirus, but um, we, are, um, we are very well prepared in Kansas for an outbreak. Back when the, the uh, Ebola situation happened in Texas and th they thought there might be a case here, KU Med Center did a massive remodeling so that they would have bed space that would be separated from the rest of the hospital and and they are completely prepared uh, for such a if we have such an outbreak great good well wonderful comments and a little bit of fireworks tonight um, that was fun yeah a good, like good discussion <laughs> uh, and uh, and I think everything went well um, again this is uh, Dr. Jay Steinmetz I'm here with representative Susan King Cannon uh, Senator uh, uh, John Dahl and Representative Ken Rogers. Um, thank you all very much for the show. I appreciate it. And um, yep, and uh, so let me give you some um, uh, thoughts on uh, next week's show. Uh, our show next week will begin at 7 p.m., same time, February 21st. We're going to have a full slate. Uh, we'll have Senator Randall Hardy. We'll have Representative Don Heineman. We'll have Representative Stephen Johnson and Representative Russ Jennings in the house on the show oh boy. Uh, next week. Should that be fun? More oh fireworks boy. maybe? No. Well, now that's a bill, you know, someone wants to have silly little fireworks year round, you can ask them that and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you'll have uh, plenty of things to talk about. <laughs> All right.
Yeah. You know, along with the fireworks, uh, I, I might mention that we are making an effort for civil discourse. So Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you all very much, and have a good evening.